Um, hello, everybody, and thanks for staying here until the end. Um, my name is Vasilios Kemerlis, and the title of my talk today is Red to Deer, Deconstructing Kernel Isolation. And this is joint work with uh, Michalis Polychronakis and Angelos Kiromitis, my colleagues from uh, Columbia University. So before starting, some stuff about myself. I'm a PhD candidate at Columbia University. I'm a member of the Network Security Lab there. I have done work on various security fields, um, and I've published it mainly, mainly in uh, academic conferences. Lately, I'm working on operating system security, and specifically on uh, kernel self-protection. Self um, and I also do some uh, offensive stuff, and this talk is part of this line of work. So um, this is the agenda for today. Red to Deer is a kernel exploitation technique. So I'm going to start by giving an introduction of how kernel attacks work and what, what exactly we try to do with this, uh, with this technique. Then I'm going to move on to how Red to Deer works and how it can be used to bypass various kernel protection mechanisms. And then I'm going to conclude by summarizing our findings. So let's start. Um, so there is an increased focus uh, on kernel exploitation in our days. So kernel attacks are becoming more and more common. And this is mainly due to three reasons. First of all, the exploitation of uh, user land privileged processes has become much harder. Throughout the years, we had various techniques, um, some of them provided by op the operating systems, some other uh, provided by compilers or a combination of, of those two, uh, which made their way uh, into most of the OSs these days. And they, they result into hardening applications um, against exploits which leads into moving the target into you know, a, different, a, different co a different piece of code in the software stack. And the kernel is an important piece of code because it's privileged. So it makes sense for somebody to go, to go after it. And not only that, it also has a huge attack surface. Um, there, there is a constant stream of new features and optimizations that gets into this part of code, which is supposedly the one that is responsible for the integrity of all the security mechanisms in, in the operating system. And um, so because of these three reasons, um, we, have, we see that attackers are trying more and more to go against the kernel instead of trying to find one privileged uh, user land process and exploit it and then go after, go, go around uh, all these, um, you know, protection mechanisms that are deployed there. Um, so on the one, th on the one th uh, hand, we have this, um, you know, interest on more kernel exploitation, but let's see um, what the kernel, what our kernels do um, in terms of, of, of bugs, of vulnerabilities, okay? So what you, you see here in this graph is the distinct number, the distinct, distinct number of uh, bugs, of CV numbers specifically, assigned to kernel bugs throughout the years for all the kernels. And we're talking about commodity operating system kernels here, like Linux, Windows, the BSDs, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, there is an increasing trend. So not only attackers go after the kernel, but they also have a lot of um, candy to, to play with. Um, now, if we take a look at the one particular operating system, this is Linux, you see that the same trend more or less exists here as well. And the question is, why do we see that? Okay, did it happen that after 2003, we became terrible in writing kernel code, or is it something else? Um, well, as I said in the beginning, there is more interest in kernel exploitation. So we have more guys auditing the code or fuzzing the code and trying to, to, to exploit it. And on this way, they find some vulnerabilities and they report it. So there is more interest, so more reported bugs. On the other hand, though, um, the number of um, lines of code that gets into at least Linux has increased a lot. But the same trend also applies into other operating systems. So as you can see here, we're comparing 2.6.11 2 with uh, 3.10, two kernel versions. One of them was. Uh, released in 2005, and the other one is two th in 2013. And you can see that the development days for these two versions is more or less the same, but the number of patches that were pushed in the same, more or less the same development cycle in the kernel was much higher. From 3.6 thousand uh, patches we have in, in the first version, we have 13.3 uh, in the uh, 3.10, which means that we go from roughly two changes per hour to 10 changes, nine changes per hour. So we have increased a lot the number of changes in kernel code. And remember, this is the part of your code that 
guarantees all, more or less all the integrity of all the security uh, protections that you have in user land. Okay. So um, to give you um, a very brief overview of what, what, what kernel attacks fall into, I have two categories here. Um, the first one is privilege escalation. So here what uh, we're talking about is um, attacks where the attacker already has some presence on the operating system. He can run something like a process or he has already managed to, let's say, take control of a particular process in the operating system. And the goal there is to escalate privilege, okay? become root, let's say. The other type of attacks uh, falls into the second category, which is the persistent foothold. There, the attacker attacks the kernel for a, for a different purpose. The purpose there is to, he already has access, root access to the machine, and he needs to hold that access. Okay, so we're talking about root kits, things like that. So in this talk, whenever I, t I talk about an attack, I'm talking about the first class, okay? The model of the attacker that we consider here, it's somebody who has already uh, local access to the machine, not privileged access, simple user access. He is able to invoke and interact with the kernel through system calls or, or through a, um, some other API which is available. And his goal is to escalate privilege. Now, in, order, in most cases, in order to do that, um, what he needs to do is to achieve what we call arbitrary code execution, be a, being able to run code with the privileges of the kernel, because this part of the code is the most privileged one in the software stack. Um, and um, in order to do that, he, more, in more cases, in, in, in all cases actually, what, what happens is that there is a bug, a memory corruption vulnerability in kernel code. Um, the same, more or less the same types of bugs that we have in user land, we have them also in, in kernel. Uh, we have use after free there, sinus errors, integer overflows, uh, wild writes, off by one, off by two, you know, all these things that we find in user land software, they exist in the kernel as well. So. These things can be abused in order to corrupt memory, and the end goal is to execute code. Now, as is the case with um, uh, user processes when we exploit them, um, we typically do that either by code injection, okay? This is what we used to do in the past. We inject some data in the process address space, and then we corrupt control data, such as a function pointer or return address, pointing it into that code, and we execute it. Now, this thing doesn't work anymore because of the defenses that get deployed uh, in, in uh, most platforms these days, such as non-executable memory or ASLR. So what we do is the same thing, but instead of injecting code, we inject control data and perform the exploitation in a rope manner. Okay? Now, kernel exploits don't work like that. Okay? There have been kernel exploits where code injection and rope has been used, but in most cases, and I'm talking about the vast majority here, um, what we do is a different type of attack, which I call return to user space. Okay? So let's see what these attacks are and how they work. These attacks, they work against operating system kernels that have a shared kernel user address space layout. Okay? And the way they work is by overwriting kernel code or data pointers with user space addresses. Now the payload, whether this is cell code or op payload tampered with data structures, depending on the exploit, depending on the vulnerability that we're exploiting, it is placed in user space, but it is executed or referenced from the kernel context. And as I said, this has been the de facto uh, kernel exploitation technique. Um, there are exploits in ExploitDB from 2003 that they use this technique. And um, the last one that I found some days ago was released in two, in this year and still uses the same technique. Um, so as you can see here, the way the whole thing works is by, as I said, hosting the payload in user space. So in other words, we don't need to inject anything in, inside the kernel because it is already there. It's already there in the address space that the kernel sees, and if we can trick it into reference it or execute it, then we win. Okay? So why do they work? They work because the separation between kernel and user space is weak. Okay? When we designed our kernels, we put kernel space along with user space inside the same address space for performance reasons. Okay? Every time Every process doesn't do anything by itself. It always calls the operating system to do something useful. Okay, write a file, open a connection, do, some, do something like that. So you always need to call the kernel. And in order to do that fast, you put, we designed our, our kernels so as that they have this thing inside the same, these two um, pieces inside the same address space so as to be able to go from user space to kernel space only by doing a mode switch. 
Of course, we could have designed it differently, and some OSs do that. The kernel can reside in a totally different address space, but then every time you need to call the kernel, you need to do a complete, co a complete cortex switch, which is much, much more expensive. Now, in this model, the kernel is protected from user land. Okay? You cannot write or read kernel memory. The memory management unit will give you a fault. Okay? So we have hard hardware support for that. The problem is that the opposite, with the opposite direction. Okay? When the kernel is running, it has complete and unrestricted access to the whole address space. And if you think about it, he needs that access, right? If you do a read call and you provide a buffer, the kernel reads that, you know, fills that buffer with the contents of a file or, or a socket or whatever. So it needs to have access to the user space, and that's why we designed the whole thing like this. Okay? Now, the problem is that part of the user space that the kernel sees, it's completely controlled by the attacker. Okay, both in terms of contents and permissions. Now, to deal with this issue, we, we, there are various uh, protections and defenses. Um, the first uh, two were proposed by and implemented by PAX. It's kernel exec and UDF. PAX is a, thir a, a set of third-party Linux patches. And um, they, they implement this. Th what they do is that they try to isolate the two. Right? When the kernel is running, they try to make to restrict what are the user space areas that the kernel has access to. Okay? So how do, it, how do they do that? In x86, they use the segmentation unit. So when the kernel gets called, they reload um, the segment registers, CS, SS, DS, and ES, so as to restrict the, and confine the kernel in kernel space in the upper part. So every reference of data and code, arbitrary reference, in user space will result in a fault from the segmentation unit. In x86-64, since um, Intel decided to uh, more or less make the segmentation unit, the checks in the, in the, in the segment registers um, ineffective, they implemented the same thing differently. Um, UDF works by remapping um, user space. So every time the kernel gets called, they tweak the page tables so as, users, so as to make sure that user space is not accessible directly. Um, and for kernel exec, what they do is that they instrument the code. Um, essentially, they, when they compile the kernel, they insert checks so as to make sure that you cannot branch and execute something from user space. KGuard is a system that I build uh, that tries to um, deal with the same problem uh, in more than one platform. So it's a cross-platform solution. It also leverages the compiler. And again, it uses instrumentation. And what we do there is that we instrument the code in, and, and inject a bunch of checks to make sure that whenever a function pointer or a return address uh, or a return instruction or, or a jump instruction gets called, it will never branch to user space. Okay? Um, so finally, Intel and ARM implemented um, two features. Um, Intel has actually two of them, SMAP and SMAP, um, and ARM PXN which do more or less the same thing, but, use, but, but, by, but by leveraging hardware. Okay? So how they work is by, um, in, by, by w leveraging the information that it's already there in the page table. So in the page table, we have information that tells us if a page belongs to the kernel or to user space. Okay? So what these things do is that they trigger a fault if you are running in kernel mode and you try to execute something from a page that belongs to user space. Uh, this is what SMAP and PXN does. And SMAP does the same thing, but for data accesses. Okay? So to summarize <laughs> what I'm trying to say uh, is the following. Um, kernel exec, KGuard, SMAP, and PXN effectively block um, the, a code pointer from pointing into uh, code in user space. So every time, these techniques, every time a function pointer gets called and that function pointer points to user space, you will get a fault immediately. And as I said, the SMAP and PXM uh, do it using hardware, the others uh, using software or hardware in case of kernel exec in uh, 32 bits and so on and so forth. Now UDRF is the same thing but for data pointers. So if you have a data pointer and you corrupt it by abusing a kernel-based uh, you know, memory corruption bug, you cannot point, make it point into user space. You can overwrite it with a value, with a user space value, but when you trigger it, either through the hardware or because the, pay, the user space is not, it's not there anymore, in case of UDRF, you will get a fault. And these techniques will 
confine essentially the control flow and the data flow in the upper part, in kernel space. Okay? So in this talk, we focus on these techniques. Um, I call them ready to user defenses because they prevent the previous exploitation technique, jumping back to user space and executing the, the, the cell code or referencing payload from user space. And what we want to answer is two, two questions. The first one is whether we can subvert them, okay? whether we can force the kernel to execute or access user control data. Because if you recall, these things were put in place in order to make sure that the kernel cannot go to user space and access whatever data are there or execute code. Okay? And second question is whether there are conflicting design choices or optimizations that weaken the, the strong separation that these features try to achieve. Okay? In the first place, the return to user attacks exist because we chose to put kernel, kernel space and user space inside the same address space. Okay? So it was a design choice. So here we want to see is the kernel ha following certain design patterns that still weaken this operation even though we have these defenses in place? This is another question that we want to answer. So red to dir is the, um, is, is the new technique that I'm going to talk about. It's called return to direct map memory. It's an attack that can be applied against hardened kernels. Everything that you're going to see here is against Linux. We focused on Linux because all the previous defenses were available there, so it was a very good test bit for us. And at the same time, um, it's an operating system that runs and drives millions of machines, so the impact there is much higher. And depending on the exploit, on the vulnerability actually, that uh, gets exploited, in most cases, for every return to user exploit that gets blocked by one of these protections, it will be possible to convert it into a red to d equivalent that bypasses it. So this is the technique that I'm going to uh, present in the next uh, of this talk. So before getting into the details of how exactly it works, let me start with the kernel space layout. Okay? So as is the case with user space, the kernel space is organized uh, in some way. And um, this, the way that it gets organized, it's different among different platforms. But for, for every instance of the same platform, it remains the same. Okay? So here you have the layouts of um, Linux in x86 and x86-64. So we have regions that uh, host the kernel image, the modules, um, you know, vmalocs, and stuff like that. What's interesting for us is a region which is called FISMAP. FISMAP is a region that is inside kernel space. And what it does is that it directly maps all physical memory in a one-to-one -one manner. Okay. So this region, if you go to this particular virtual address that this region, the region starts and you reference it, you're going to get essentially the, context, the contents of the first page frame in RAM. If you go a page above that, then you get the contents of the second page frame, and so on and so forth. Now, in 64-bit systems, um, this region is big enough to more or less uh, map the whole RAM. Okay, so in... Uh, uh, x86 uh, 64 Linux, for instance, this region is 64 terabytes. And since in most cases you're not going to find machines with 64 terabytes of RAM, the whole RAM is going to fit inside that region. In 32-bit systems, uh, you have less space. So in the most typical scenario where you split the address space uh, in such a way where you assign 1 gigabyte in kernel and 3 gigabytes in user space, then because of other stuff that also rely on that 1 gigabyte of the kernel address space, you end up with roughly 891 uh, megabytes that directly map physical memory. So if your physical memory is two gigabytes, the first 800 will be directly mapped there. If you're, and the rest are not. If you're in the rare case where you have like 512 megabytes, the whole RAM again fits inside that region and it's there. Um, so what is the uh, role of that thing? Why do we have it? Well, it seems that uh, this thing is very important for the kernel. It's a fundamental building block of dynamic kernel memory because it allows us to allocate memory without altering page tables, more or less. So this means that we have minimal latency in fast path operations. So if we do a K malloc inside an interrupt service routine, we can get, we can get memory without, without touching page tables, without invalidating caches, without doing all these things. Uh, it also inflicts less TLB pressure. We, we don't need to flash the TLB. Uh, the other benefit of that design is that virtually contiguous memory, it's guaranteed to be physically contiguous as well. 
So if we do a K-malloc and we take that memory and we assign it to a device to do DMA, we don't have to worry about whether you know, uh, frames which are sequential in virtual memory are not sequential in DMA. So when the device gets DMA, these things will have to go all over the place. And then we, do, we need to do scatter gather to get them back in place and so on and so forth. Um, and of course, we, under such a scheme, the page frame accounting is super easy. Okay? If I give you a virtual page, if I give you a page frame number, you can get the virtual address inside that region very easily. You just multiply it by the page size and you add the offset that this thing starts from. And the opposite is that when you get a virtual address, you can get the page frame number just by subtracting the, the offset of the region and then dividing by the page size. So it's very, the kernel then can do very quickly go from a virtual address to the page frame or from the page frame to a virtual address. And this is something that happens a lot inside the, the kernel, sorry. Um, so let's see um, some properties of this region, okay? So as I said, um, the starting offset of this region differs in various architectures and also differs depending on the configuration uh, between, of the, uh, not the configuration, actually the split between kernel and user space in various uh, architectures, uh, which also affects the size of this region. So in x86, for instance, in the most typical scenario where you have three gigabytes in user space and one gigabyte in kernel space, it starts from C000000, you know, this address. Um, the size of this thing is 891 megabytes. And if you go to different splits, you have a different starting address and more size and so on and so forth. Um, now what's important to note is that these things are not affected by KSLR. So even though you, you may have kernel space, uh, kernel address space layout randomization, the starting offset of this will remain the same. Okay? What gets moved is the kernel text area and the kernel data and you know, these, these things. The region, the FISMAP region will remain there and it will always start from this uh, fixed um, you know, offset. It's also uh, interesting to see what are the protection uh, bits in the page tables, in the page table entries for this particular region. In x86, this region is mapped uh, readable and writable. Um, but in the other architectures, unfortunately, uh, the permission bits of that region are not in the same state. Okay? Um, the last uh, kernel version that I, uh, x86-64 kernel version that um, had it executable was everything below 3.9. So there you have it readable, writable, and executable. Everything um, after that, it's only um, read-write. Um, same thing for 32-bit ARM for versions before uh, 3.14. Uh, and last time I checked, uh, it was still read-writable and executable in the 64-bit ARM. Now remember that, we're gonna use it later. Um, so what's our threat model? The threat model that we, um, we assume here is that we have a vulnerability that allows us to overwrite uh, kernel code or data pointers with user controlled values. And this is not something, um, this is not a strong assumption. We have a lot of bugs and a lot of vulnerabilities that we can leverage to do that. And we also assume a, a hardened kernel. Okay, we assume the kernel that gets um, a strong user uh, kernel separation through one of the, the protections or may, more than one uh, that I talked about before. So we cannot do the return to user attack that we could do before, okay? So let's see how it works, okay? Now, we have the physical, recall that we have the physical RAM directly mapped inside that region, okay? Now, whenever we get from user space, whenever user space gets physical memory, it gets it in a lazy manner, okay, through page faults. Okay, you allocate a big chunk of memory in user space, in user space, say through MMAP, but this doesn't mean that you got it immediately. You need to start writing in those regions so as to cause page faults and then get physical memory from the OS. Okay? Now the problem with this approach is that because of the existence of FISMAP, we get we, res, we end up with address aliasing. Okay? We end up with more than one addresses pointing into the same physical page frame, okay? So how, how we do that, right? So in the beginning, everything is inside FISMAP. So there is a kernel address that maps into that particular page frame. When the page frame gets allocated to user space, another virtual address, a user space virtual address, now maps to the same page frame. So we have two now. And this is the whole thing, this is the basis of this attack. 
So since we have two aliases, one, in, and the problem is that these aliases rely into two different, um, lie actually in two into two different protection domains, one in kernel space and one in user space, what we can do is that we can use the user space address to copy our payload, whatever that is, cell code, raw payload, tampered with data structures, whatever, somewhere in physical memory. This means that it is directly accessible through its synonym in the FISMAP region. And then when we go ahead and corrupt a code or a, a, co a kernel code pointer or a, co or a kernel data pointer, instead of corrupting it with the user space address, we can corrupt those pointers and overwrite them with the synonyms of those addresses in FISMAP and bypass all the previous protection mechanisms because all of them rely on identifying user addresses, more or less, We're using different techniques. Okay? So let's see how we're gonna do that. Um, we have various problems to deal with here. Okay, the first one is to pinpoint, of course, the exact location of a synonym of user control data in the FISMAP area, okay? So suppose I copy something here in user space, as I said, this thing gets into FISMAP as well, I need to know the exact ad address inside FISMAP because when I'm gonna corrupt something, like a data pointer in, use, in, kernel, in kernel space, I need to corrupt it and overwrite it with the exact address um, inside FISMAP that is a synonym of, of the user space. So the first problem is to know the exact location of user control data in the FISMAP region. The second problem that we have to deal with is that in some cases, um, as I said before, you don't have the complete RAM, the complete physical memory ins mapped inside the FISMAP region. Um, this is uh, actually typical in 32-bit architectures because as we saw before, it's only uh, 891 megabytes directly mapped. So there, the problem is that we need to force the synonym to emerge inside the FISMAP area. In other words, we need to force the allocator to give us to, to map a user uh, to map user content into a page frame that falls inside that region which has synonyms. Um, and the last uh, problem is that sometimes we have payloads that don't, don't fit into one, uh, one single page. Okay, they span more than one pages. Pages which are, which are virtually contiguous in user space doesn't mean that they're gonna be physically contiguous as well and this means that they're not gonna be contiguous inside FISMAP. So the problem that we need to solve there is how can we construct um, you know, re regions which are contiguous inside FISMAP and then put our payload there so as to be contiguous when the uh, kernel references it. So let's see which one of them separately. So I'll start with the first one. The first one is the most important one, right? And essentially is the, how I can answer this question. Given a user space virtual address, say you add, how can I find the kernel space address which, which essentially maps the same content? Now to do that, we turn to the usual suspect, the ProcFS file system. Starting with the version 2.6.25, um, there's a new interface that was added inside Proc to allow page table examination from user space for debugging purposes. So what you can do with this thing is that you can go into Proc PID, where PID is the uh, process ID of one particular process, open the file called PageMap, and then this file is indexed by the virtual page, the, by virtual page number, okay? So if, we, if, I have, if I have a user address and get from that user ad address the virtual page number, just by divided by um, the page size, and seek into that file into the appropriate uh, location and read eight bytes, what I'm gonna have is some flags which tell me whether, whether the page is present or not and stuff like that. But the most important thing is that I also have inside that, that number, um, those eight bytes, the page frame number where this uh, particular user space virtual address maps to, okay? So in other words, I can open this file and given a user space address, I can get the page frame number of that virtual address, okay? Say it's page frame number 11. Now, given that I know that the FISMAP maps physical memory in a one-to-one -one manner, if I have the page frame number for a particular user address, what I can do is that I can multiply that by the page size and add the FISMAP offset, which I know, which I know that it's constant for different uh, combinations of architectures and, and, and um, you know, configurations, uh, and it's not affected by ASLR, and then I can get K other. The, the thing that I want. Now in certain cases, um, the, 
first page frame number happens to be something different than zero. So there I just have to do small subtraction. Um, I just subtract uh, the minimum page frame number from the one that I get, and then I, supply, I multiply it by page size and, and I add the offset. Okay? So the way it works is the following. I use uadder to map something in physical memory. Then I do a lookup in page map. I get the page frame number. I stick it into that formula, and then I have kadder. And now what, what, what I do is that I go and corrupt code, uh, um, kernel code or data pointers with kadder. And now when the kernel is going to trigger that thing, it will never branch to user space, but it will reference and execute or, or reference data uh, that were controlled by me. I put them there in, in that physical memory location. OK. Um, so this is how I, I deal with the first problem. Let's see the second one. Um, in 32-bit systems, as I said, you have the problem that only part of the physical memory gets mapped inside FISMA. Um, as, as I said many times, in the most typical setting, you have only 800 megabytes. Okay? So what happens in that case? It, what, what happens is that you have, there may be, there, there, actually there are going to be many cases where, particular, where, where certain user space address don't have synonyms in FISMAP. Why? Because they don't reside in the first 800 megabytes of the RAM. Okay? So in order to deal with this, um, we have first to, to, tell you how, to, to tell you how our solution works. We need to talk a little bit about how Linux um, manages physical memory. Okay? So physical memory is divided into certain regions or zones. And Linux, we have a zone called zone DMA. This zone maps the first 16 megabytes of physical RAM. So all the page frames of the first 16 megabytes fall into something which is called zone DMA. Then we have zone normal. Zone normal contains all the page frames that start after the first 16 megabytes, and they go up either to the size of FISMAP or the size of RAM, whichever is the minimum here. And then we have zone HIMEM. Okay? Zone HIMEM has all the other page frames. So if you have, let's say, a system, 32-bit system with 4 gigabytes of RAM, first 16 megabytes of physical RAM go to zone DMA. Everything between 16 megabytes and 891 megabytes go into zone normal and all the rest go to zone HIMEM. Okay? So also, uh, there is an ordering there. So whenever user space gets page frames, it always gets the page frames first from zone HIMEM. If all the page frames in zone HIMEM are depleted, then it tries zone normal. If all the page frames there are depleted, then it tries do zone DMA. Okay? Why does that? Because the first two zones they are they contain the the page frames that are you know are those page frames which are used for the kernel um, to, for, for the kernel itself when it needs uh, dynamic memory right so the kernel tries to preserve that region for dynamic um, kernel memory requests from itself and first tries to give to serve user space using hymen okay so the question here is whether we can force the allocator the zone allocator which is a particular piece inside the kernel that manages the page frames to provide uh, something in user space from a page frame in user space, either from zone normal or zone DMA. If we do that, then it means that this page frame will have a synonym, and we can use the previous technique to, to get its uh, synonym address. So how do we do that? Um, the way that the algorithm works is the following. We allocate a big chunk of memory in user space. Okay, we can take MMAP, SHMAT, wherever. And then for every page there, we trigger a write fault. Every time we trigger a write fault, it means that the, page, the, the kernel will allocate a physical page frame to this particular user space address that triggered the fault. Okay? For every page inside that region then, we check the page frame number using um, page map. If that page frame number is less than PFN max, where PFN max is the maximum page frame number in the FISMAP region, um, what we found page frame which has a synonym. Okay? In our words, what I'm saying here, I'm, I'm just using page map again to, query, uh, to, to do a query and get the page frame number and check if that page frame number falls inside the first 891 megabytes. If it does, it means that it's, there is a synonym for that thing inside the FISMAP. If not, I keep doing the same thing again and again and again. Why? Because as I'm doing that, I'm allocating more and more frames, right? Depleting zone HIMEM, 
And then at some point where no other frames are available in Zollheimem, I will trigger the kernel into give me, giving me a page frame for the other two, from the other two zones, which have synonyms. Okay? Now, in 32-bit uh, machines, you only have, and depending on the configuration um, that says how many uh, gigabytes of RAM you have for user space and how many you have in kernel space, um, you may need to, do, to spawn additional processes to do that. Okay? So in the most typical scenario, you have, as I said before, three gigabytes of RAM available per process for the user space part. Right? So at most, you can deplete three gigabytes of memory. If you have eight, you may need to, to spawn additional processes. All of them are going to start doing this thing, and at some point, one of them uh, will get a page frame that falls inside the region that we want. Once we found that um, particular page frame, we can kill every, ev everything else. We can do, use mlock to lock it in main memory and compute the kernel address using the previous formula. Okay? Now, something to note here is that memory pressure helps. Okay? If, you, if other processes are running in the system and they are... Um, using memory, and they use a lot of memory, this, is, this helps us, okay? This makes this word work easier because instead of having to spawn all these additional processes to waste that memory, somebody else has already done that for us. Now let's see the third problem. The third problem is to uh, force synonym pages to be contiguous inside Facebook, okay? Um, the, way this th the way we deal with this problem is similar to how we dealt with the previous one. We allocate a big chunk of memory in user space. For every page, we trigger a page fault. And then what we do is that, is that we try to find two different pages whose page frame numbers differ by one. Okay? So we do the query again using page map, and we try to see if I can find, find PI and PJ pages whose page frame numbers are different by one. If I find them, then it means that the synonyms of those pages are contiguous in FISMAP. All right? So to give you an example, if I have the addresses fib and beef, okay, and suppose that these um, addresses um, have page frame numbers that are different only by one, although these, although, the, although these two different virtual pages are 64 megabytes apart in user space, their synonyms are contiguous in FISMAP. So what I can do is that I can take my payload, split it into, the, into, two, into these two pages, and then reference it using their synonyms inside FISMAP. Their synonyms are going to be contiguous. Um, so, next question. What if page, so all the previous uh, problems, I solved them by essentially leaking some information regarding page frame numbers from page map, okay? So what if page frame information is not available? So you can think that it's, you know, as you, as you already might assume, it's very easy to block access to this particular interface, and not, then the question is, are all these attacks going to go away? Well, unfortunately, the answer is no. <laughs> um, the, previous, the previous techniques are all deterministic, okay? So if you follow them, for every user address, you can find deterministically the kernel address, which is a synonym for a user space address, and then do the attack that way. If you don't have that information, you can still do the same thing, but in a probabilistic way, okay? So we call this FISMAP spraying, and it's very similar to how heap spraying works. So the idea here is to essentially take a pollute FISMAP with aligned copies of the exploit payload so as to maximize the footprint of user content inside FISMAP. And then what we do is that we pick an arbitrary page-aligned FISMAP address, and we use that uh, in our exploit. Okay? Depending on how much... Um, how many pages we have managed to copy our payload inside FISMAP, uh, we increase our probability to reach one of them uh, that has the payload and not something else. Um, so the way it works is by, as I said, by copying the payload into N resident, uh, FISMAP resident pages, okay? And the probability of succeeding is essentially N over the size of FISMAP, okay? So what we try to do here is essentially maximize this probability. And to maximize it, we either maximize n or minimize um, the denominator. So to maximize n, again, it's more or less the same thing. We allocate memory and user space, we trigger page faults, and we copy the payload into the memory that we acquired. Okay? Now here we cannot use mlock, because mlock can only, alloc can only lock and pinpoint in memory some kilobytes of RAM. Here we want to, you know, more or less deplete the whole RAM with aligned copies of our payload, right? So since we cannot do that, what we do is that we can start a set of background threads 
that repeatedly mark pages as dirty by writing, let's say, a single byte, okay, which will cause the kernel, which will prevent the kernel from activating swapping. It will think that these pages are hot, so it will say, okay, I'm not going to touch that, and it will go to another process and find another victim process to start doing the swapping from that one. Okay? And as we do that, we check the resident set size, which is essentially how many physical, um, how many pages in, in physical memory this process has. And as we do that, if that value goes up, it means that we acquire more and more physical memory, so we maximize our foothold inside FISMAP. At the moment this thing will start going down, it means that we reach a peak, and from now on we cannot allocate any more because either we have depleted the whole RAM or swapping has started kicking in and swaps out our own stuff. So at this, stop, at this point we stop and we do the attack in a probabilistic way and we will succeed depending on how, depending on how many pages we've managed to copy our exploit payload inside the FISMAP region. Okay? And as was the case in the previous um, scenario, again here we may need to spawn additional processes to do that thing. Okay, if we are in a 32-bit system and we can only um, deplete like three gigabytes of RAM, of course we, we need to, to use many processes to do that thing. We cannot do it only with one. Um, now the other clever thing that we can do is that we can, instead of considering all the pages inside FISMAP as valid targets, what we can do is that we can have something which, called, which we call FISMAP signatures. Essentially we reduce the target pages inside FISMAP this way. Um, we know that certain regions in physical memory have content that is never going to be allocated, have content, and this means from, for, let's say, for um, used by, from the BIOS or from the kernel itself, which means that the kernel will never, you know, supply that page frame in user space, okay? So we, c we know all these page frames, so we can exclude them from our selection, and essentially we can increase our probability into, into succeeding. Okay. For instance, we know where the kernel text is, and or we know that the first page frame is used by BIOS. So there is never, you know, it's 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 never going to be the case that the page frame zero is going to have content controlled by user space. So we don't co compute that when we do our, um, you know, randomly randomly select something. So um, to to give you an overview of everything and how the whole attack works. I'll try to do a walkthrough using a, a real vulnerability. Here I'm using um, CV 2013-2094. It's a bug in the um, Linux perf events subsystem. So as you can see here, the vulnerable function is perf SW event init. It's inside kernel events core. And what it does is that it takes a particular data, a pointer to a data structure and then it extracts a particular field, stores it into a local variable, and so on and so forth. So the problem is that the local variable um, that the field gets stored to is an integer, whereas the field is an unsigned 64-bit uh, field. So this means that, ah, and the next, um, at some point later, there is a check to make sure that since this thing is going to be used as an index into an array, there is a check to make sure that we won't go over the bound of the array. Now the problem is that when config gets converted into an integer, right, um, we may end up with something that it's a negative value. And the check there only checks the upper bound, not the lower bound, right? So that's, the, that's a vulnerability. So we'll, we'll see how we can use this thing. Um, this is the uh, internal structure of uh, the perf event data structure. It has three fields um, enabled and two pointers. The enabled one is essentially a counter. Um, it's an atomic, um, it's a value which gets increased atomically. And the size of this data structure is 24 bytes in 64-bit systems and 12 bytes in 32-bit systems. Okay, so and all um, that all all that uh, this function does, the slow key, the static key slow ink does is that it takes the first field enabled and increases that field by one. Okay, so that's that's what this um, this part of the code does. Okay, so let's see how we can we can abuse it. Um, here I'm gonna 
talk by assuming that we have um, we're running Ubuntu 12.04, uh, um, the LTS version, and the kernel version is 3.8.0, dust um, 19, dust generic. Okay, this thing has been patched, uh, so it's not there anymore. But you can always install the previous version, and you will see that all these things are there, and you can play with it. Um, so what we have here is that the address of the perf of our array, the perf SW event enabled array is somewhere inside the kernel data. And the kernel data are in the kernel image region. Okay, after uh, the kernel image, of course. So our strategy here is that given the vulnerability, we can go and reference memory below the array, right? We, can go, we cannot go after the array because there is a check there uh, that checks the upper bound of the array. But if we provide the negative value, we can go to memory addresses before the array into lower values. Okay, so our strategy is to find a function pointer which belongs into the kernel image and specifically to the data section because it needs to be writable so as to overwrite it with something. And moreover, the difference between the address of that function pointer and the address of our array needs to be a multiple of 24 in that particular case because it's a 64-bit <coughs> system, right? And if you recall, the size of the data structure was 24 in 64 bits. So we can only corrupt the first of the uh, the first the first eight. We take the first eight bytes of the 24 bytes, and we can only increase it by one. So this is what this thing is about. Um, so if we do we do our um, analysis in that kernel, we can find out that this particular function pointer, um, the function pointer shm underscore shmat, is located at this address, which um, which is um, in a lower address from uh, the array, and it's a multiple of 24. The difference of those two addresses is a multiple of 24. So this is the function pointer that we're gonna corrupt essentially, okay? So how we do that? Well, we provide this value, negative value, as index in the array, okay? And by doing that, we go from, essentially from here, down to this particular address here, which is the function pointer that we need to corrupt, okay? Now, this function pointer initially points into a function called cap shm shmat, okay? This is in, inside the text uh, region of the kernel, okay? This is it. Now, every time we provide this invalid index into the array and we call the static key slow ink, we increase the function pointer by one. Now the problem is that the cont if I do all, all the things that I said before, the content that I manage to control is inside the FISMAP region, my cell code, let's say, okay? Uh, here it's a 64-bit machine. If you recall, in this particular version, FISMAP is executable. So I copy something in user space, it becomes executable code in kernel inside FISMAP, okay? But this thing is at lower addresses than where my function pointer points at, right? Every time I do the increment, I go to higher addresses. I don't go back down here, okay? So this is a problem, this is a problem right? So how do we deal with it? Well, by doing a little bit of code reuse. Um, if we see all the instructions from starting from cap SHM, SHM mat, and upwards, we can find an instruction called call RSI. And this instruction is that many bytes, like uh, uh, 171,538 bytes ahead of the original function pointer. Um, what's important for this, uh, why the, the important thing of this gadget is that uh, it calls into a location pointed by the RSI register, okay? Now, when I call this system call here, SHMAT, what will happen is that the corrupted function pointer will get invoked, okay? So up armor SHMAT, SHM underscore SHMAT will get invoked. And then I also control the contents of the RSI register because RSI happens to have the second argument of that call, okay? So how it works. <laughs> I map my payload in user space using the techniques that I said, talked about in the beginning, which will make them available in kernel space as well, okay? So these two addresses essentially are synonyms, right? 
then what I do is that I call the vulnerable system call with the negative index here, right? That many times, so as to make sure that my function pointer will point now from the original function to call RSI. And then I call SHMAT with the synonym address of my payload in kernel space. What will happen here is that, not game over yet, so what will happen here is that SHMAT will branch to call RSI and call RSI will branch to my cell code here. And this is how I ex execute it. Now keep in mind, I never wrote something here. That's the most important part. I wrote it in the user space address, which was a synonym of that thing. And then by using a little bit of code reuse, I managed to branch there and execute it. So this is how we, this is how the attack works and this is how we do it. Now, the next question, and I'm gonna wrap up, um, is what happens if FISMAP is not executable, okay? In 32-bit systems, FISMAP is not executable and it's very easy in the latest kernels to fix that thing and have everything not executable, okay? Um, here I'm using 32-bit um, uh, Linux, um, Ubuntu 12.04 LTS, again, different kernel. Um, it's the same vulnerability, so the symbols that you see here are the same that I used before. Here we have the data structure that we try to exploit has a, has a size of 12. So again, we, what we need to, to find here is a function pointer at the lower address from our array, and the difference between that function pointer, the address of that function pointer, and the original array should be a multiple of 12. Here we find a different one, default security ops, SHM, SHM at. Okay, the layout, as you can see, is a little bit different. And what we do is that we do, we're gonna do the same attack using pure op, okay? So what I'm trying to, give, to show you here is that the same, the red to is, is a way to essentially make content available inside kernel space, okay? Depending on the vulnerability that you're exploiting and depending on the permission bits on the page tables of FISMAP, you can either inject something which is cell code or you can inject some, something else which is a raw payload or tampered with data structures and whatever. So the technique itself, the only thing that allows you to do is to make sure that user control content is inside kernel space. How, what content is gonna be that and how you're gonna use it, it depends on the exploit, on the vulnerability that you're trying to exploit, okay? So here, for instance, it's the same vulnerability, but since it's not executable, what we do is that we do the same thing. The payload that we're injecting, it's not cell code, it's a ROP payload, okay? Um, here, again, I'm using a different uh, negative index to corrupt. It's more or less the same thing, right? We have the original function pointer pointing here. Then I call, I, I use a different, I just use a different uh, negative index. I corrupt it many times, and every time I corrupt it, it goes up one value until I reach a different gadget. In this particular case, the, the gadget that I reach is this one, okay? And when I call the system call, then I'm gonna control EDX, okay? So, as I said, this time I inject a raw payload, okay? Um, the raw payload, let's say, let's suppose that it's up here. Okay. This is not code, it's only addresses of gadgets from inside the, the tech segment of the kernel. So when I call it, what's gonna happen is that it's gonna go to um, this, this particular address here, the first, read the first gadget, and start the raw sequence. So how it works is that, again, the same thing. I use the technique to map something in kernel space. These are the synonyms in this particular scenario, okay? This is the user space address. This is the equivalent synonym inside kernel space. I call the vulnerable system call with, the, um, with this argument that many times. This means that at, at that point, I have corrupted my function pointer to point into the gadget that I want. And then by invoking the vulnerable system call with the synonym address, I will start my rope chain. And what the rope does is a little bit of stack pivoting in the beginning. Um, this will bring the stack up here, and then it will start executing those gadgets. These are all addresses from the kernel text segment, which will essentially call commit creds with the address of init cred and elevate the privileges of the running process to root, and then what we do is some cleanup to make sure that the whole thing is gonna continue running and we won't crash the kernel. 
and that's it. So I also have a demo before closing. Um, I'm gonna dem I'm gonna show you how the um, uh, first one first exploit works. So it's um, as you can see, it's a 64-bit system here, um, and it runs the vulnerable kernel that I showed you before. Um, the user that I'm using is root. It's a simple user; doesn't have any, uh, you know, special privileges. Um, and this is the exploit. Nothing as UID or something, you know, weird here. So, yeah, let's start it. So the way it works is that, as I presented at the beginning, it finds the addresses of various symbols, and then what it does is that it calls um, the vulnerable system call as many times as it wants, that many times, so as to be able to corrupt the uh, function pointer that I talked about. The most important part is this one, okay? This is the user space address, which is also kernel mapped here. So after corrupting everything, I use this address to put the cell code and this address to reference it. This is happening in this part called cell code stitching. Then I'm just triggering it and I elevated my privileges to root. And that's it. Um, so we're running out of time, so I'm gonna be super, super quick. Um, we did the same thing to other exploits as well. What we did was that we go, went to ExploitDB, took various exploits, tested those exploits into protected kernels. Um, we checked that the, all those exploits got prevented, and then we went and modified them using this technique and ran them again. In all cases, we managed to bypass the deployed protections. A note here, when I say bypassed, it doesn't really mean that these protections have something, there's something bad with those protections, okay? These are good and we should have them there. The problem is that the kernel is having FISMAP regions, okay? It's a design issue. The kernel has a region that directly maps memory and creates aliases. And these aliases also, um, you know, um, rely, rely into two different protection domains, user space and kernel space. That's the most important uh, problem here. There's nothing wrong with those protections. It's just that the kernel has made a design choice that we can exploit it to go around uh, those protections. Um, one final thing before closing. If we do, um, you may wonder what's the probability of succeeding when we don't do the you know, deterministic attack, but we do it probabilistically. What I have here is, um, in this graph, we vary the physical memory. And on the x-axis, on the y-axis, you, you can see the success probability for various um, different scenarios, an idle system, a system where we browse, and a system where we do a kernel build. As you can see, even in the, when the, the, the amount of memory is only one gigabyte, so there's a lot of contention between all these processes, we, we run a kernel build in the background. When we do the attack, we have 0.65 to 0.68 success probability. Now, as we move to higher, uh, to, to systems with more physical memory, this can go up to 0.95, which means that in that case, we have more or less managed to <laughs> copy the payload in every, more or less every page frame. So when we randomly select one, we always succeed. Um, if you go to this, um, before closing, if you go to this uh, URL here, we have prepared a bunch of VMs. These VMs come ready with various kernels, which are vulnerable to um, the exploits that I showed quickly before in my table. And the same uh, VMs have protected kernels, and they contain the source code of the original exploits and the modified ones. So you can go, take them, download them, and you can try any combination you want. You can get the original exploits, see that they, are, they don't work on a protected kernel, then run our versions to see how we bypass them, and so on and so forth. And with that, I can take questions. So I'm fairly certain that there doesn't exist an equivalent to FISMAP on Windows, but I'm just wondering, did you look into this on Windows and Mac? And what mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I don't think that you have exactly the same thing. The thing is that you have other stuff that they result into more or less something equivalent. So all operating systems have the notion of a page cache. 
The page cache is a region that acts as a cache every time you do I.O. Okay? So you have a file, when you execute it, you do I.O., you bring those pages somewhere in physical memory, and then every time you need to access the same file again, you don't need to do the I.O. again, right? The thing is that this thing essentially will result into a FISMAP-like region again, because you have content where you control and gets injected inside the kernel address space. So instead of using FISMAP as it is right now, you can use the page cache in an operating system that doesn't have a FISMAP region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the situation, right? Um, red to red to dir can work, assuming that you have. It's it's not it's some, not something that we buy, will will allow you to exploit something that was not exploitable in a red to, to user scenario. Okay, so if you have a red to user scenario that has a way to go around KSLR, if it has a memory disclosure vulnerability, for example, that it's abusing, you will use the same thing again to do this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I didn't say that there is no way, but um, yeah, the thing is that the way it is designed, it allows you to go around a particular a particular set of mechanism that was deployed there to separate kernel and user space. Uh, the thing is that um, we see that this thing is a, is a design pattern. It is also used in other operating systems. Uh, I haven't checked Windows, but Solaris has it. Uh, the BSDs have it as well, and I'm pretty sure that others, um, you know, if we check others, we're going to find similar stuff there as well. Uh, now, if you check our white paper, uh, we have a defense for that. Um, it's not perfect, but it's something that you can start, you know, if you're interested, you can start with that, and then maybe somebody else can kick in and, um, you know, join the effort and make it even better. <laughs> Any other question? Okay.